Uh, welcome back to the podcast, guys. I'm honored to have John Kim, otherwise known as the Angry Therapist, on the podcast this week. How are you today, John? I'm doing well. They, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining me. Um, I first got introduced to you on Armchair Expert, Dax Shepard's oh, podcast. Yeah, yeah. That, and ever um, since then, that um, did a lot for me, man. I mean, because he, I mean, he has so many people that listen to that show, and uh, it's a great show. So uh, you were one of them that that was that was listening on the other side. Awesome. That's right. And and then I got to jump into your community and uh, definitely follow along with your own podcast, The Angry Therapist, as well as the single on purpose Facebook community. So that's where I've gotten to know you a little bit better, but let's introduce you to the, uh, to the audience and tell us a little bit about how you became the angry therapist. Yeah. Um, for me, it all started with a divorce uh, about 10 years ago. Um, after a divorce starting all over and I was just, um, you know, I uh, just entered the, uh, the therapist journey. So I was back in school. I was 35 uh, broke, no friends, uh, you know, going from um, screenwriting to now becoming a therapist, feeling very lost and um, had a lot of time on my hands, didn't know what to do. Uh, so I decided to start a blog and Tumblr was, was kind of big at the time. And so um, I just called it the angry therapist and um, started to write down my feelings and, and document my story. I didn't know that anyone would read it. And I think the, um, that made it very easy for me. You know how they say, you know, dance like no one's watching. I was, uh, I was writing like no one would read it. And so um, that, that made me kind of fearless. And then it turned out people actually wanted to read it. Uh, and then it kind of, from there, you know, uh, sessions and then helping people on uh, social media and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I, I tune in on Instagram mostly. Uh, that's where um, I stay connected with your, um, with your authentic sharing of helpful hints. I think the other one was, the other day was um, how to handle rejection. Oh, and yeah. then we'll get to another one of my favorites here in a bit. But is that what you mean by you went through your own rebirth? Yeah, uh, going through. So when I was uh, married, I, I was a boy. I was a child. I was not self-aware. Um, you know, I did some of my own therapy, but I wasn't a therapist. Uh, I was living outside in instead of inside out. And then um, after the divorce, going through... Um, just the beginning of a rebirth, you know, like, who am I? What do I like? Um, getting to know myself. And that's kind of uh, the, it's kind of the theme for my next book, Single on Purpose. It's the idea of finding yourself first, you know? And so that was the beginning at 35, me discovering um, who I was. And, uh, you know, it wasn't easy. It was just, um, it was just a, uh, um, a lot of a lot of time by myself, uh, asking a lot of important questions and, and all of that, you know. But I think we all go through a version of that, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's why your your story and your journey resonates with me so much, is because after two long term, three and a half year long relationships back to back, mm -hmm. I went through my own rebirth, and that began at the really at the end of that second relationship, and that's why we we kind of. Uh, kind of spread apart. We drifted yeah. apart because I found growth and she wanted to stay where she was at. Oh. And so that's why, that's why your story resonates so much with me right around the same time and age as well. Like 36. Yeah. I started jujitsu. Oh, uh, nice. started, yeah. <laughs> started becoming my own purpose person again. And for the last three years I've been single on purpose as well. Yeah. So yeah, I tried jujitsu for about three months. Uh, loved it, but you know it's uh, it's such an art, and I think it take, they say it takes like ten years to really get good at it. And I was like, God, ten years, um, and it, it was just so time consuming. With uh, I was also crossfitting a lot, and I, and so I ended up stopping. But uh, I love that. How is that for you? Mm -hmm. It's probably the best choice I've ever made for myself. Wow. Um, it gives me a spiritual component to my personal growth because yeah. if you're not present on the mat, you'll get hurt. Sure. And you'll get beat every time. Right, right. So yeah, about 10 years to become a black belt. Um, I've been training for three and a half years. I'm still a blue belt nice. and good is relative, you know, like in the, right. in the space of like, well, how grow, how much growth have you seen in the last three years? Well, it's all relative to where I started. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's why I love the sport. Yeah, it's interesting. So for me, um, I found uh, CrossFit and it wasn't so much the, uh, um, the fitness part of it. It was uh, 
all the gymnastic movements um, that connected me to the uh, 12 year old break dancer in the 80s, you know, who ended up growing up and, and, and putting that away. Um, because I think sometimes growth is more about a reunion than anything else. And so um, for me, it was CrossFit, for you, it's Jiu Jitsu. And then I got into, you know, um, riding motorcycles and stuff. But um, yeah, all of that was a, a huge part of my, my rebirth. Mm -hmm. I, I watched my daughter do jujitsu for two years. Mm. Uh, she's turning, she's turning 18 next month. And I know you're wow. a brand new dad. So welcome to the journey of yeah. parenting a daughter. <laughs> Wait a minute. How old are you? I'm 40. Just turned 40 on Sunday. Whole, and your daughter's 18? She will be next month. Yeah. So you had a kid at what age? Eight, 22. Eight? 22. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's amazing. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm 47. My daughter's five months and, um, you know, we're just now starting to sleep and I just have a whole new appreciation and respect for, for parents. And, and also for a 22 year old, how was, what was that like? How did you survive that? You know, for the first couple of years of her life, her mom and I did that together. You know, I chose to work. Um, I was yeah. restaurant manager for a long time and she stayed home with our daughter, which was a, a great synergy in the beginning. And then, um, I just started to self-sabotage and uh, we definitely were way too young um, to grow together through that. Mm -hmm. And I was actually just talking to a client about this this morning that I have so much more love and admiration now for my daughter's mom mm. than I ever did when we were together right. Be right? because of how much each of us has grown since the divorce. Sure. And I wonder if um, the, the, I'm assuming you're not with her anymore, right? No. Right. So I wonder if not being with her gave you new lenses. Sometimes we're, when we're in a relationship, it's, it's hard to see objectively and it's hard to appreciate it. It's hard, you know, cause we have, we're bringing so much to the table in history and all of that. So, um, yeah, that's great. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. And I certainly hadn't worked through my own shit when I was trying to be a young dad mm -hmm. and a young husband all at the same time. Yeah. Well also, man, so young. And I think, you know, um, our, our parents that was kind of normal 22 and you know but but um for us i think that's really young to be a, a dad so good for you yeah I, I agree and watching my daughter graduate high school um her graduation ceremony is this coming saturday and then wow. i'm celebrating my birthday party and on mm. father's day this year it was like a it was a moment of transition and transformation in my life where i sat with my daughter at a restaurant and I said, Hey, what do you want our relationship to look like moving forward? Wow. And she is like, you know what? I really don't know yet. And we live an hour apart. So it takes an effort to go see her every, every so often for lunches and dinners mm -hmm. and whatever we can do to get together. She's been busy with high school and that's her priority. And I'm so proud of her for finishing Yeah. as a very young, very young 17 year old. And I was like, well, what it looks like to me is communicating once a week over FaceTime at least. Mm -hmm. I know you have your first job. I know you're going to go to college in the fall. I want you to have priorities in your life mm -hmm. that don't revolve around me or our relationship. Right. Wow. That's, uh, it's amazing that you could have conversations like this with your daughter, you know? She's so cool, man. <laughs> Man, I see you lighten up and that's awesome. You know, I, uh, part of my story is working in nonprofit with uh, um, teenage addicts. I mean, a, a kid's actually your daughter's age and um, hundreds of them over the span of about four years. And the common thread was uh, dad was not there. You know, dad mm -hmm. was not present. Dad was not either physically there or emotionally there. And so I saw the, um, the byproduct of that, which was, you know, um, kids who were lost, kids who didn't get that emotional milk, um, kids who couldn't draw boundaries and um, lots of coping through uh, drugs and alcohol. Yeah, that hits home for me because, um, you know, uh, looking back on my parenting, of course, there's a lot of things that I've learned along the way that I would change. Mm -hmm. And being present physically is one thing, but being absent while present, just in a physical body, still oh. being absent mentally yeah. and emotionally, that's yeah. a whole nother story. And that's what hits homes for me. That's what hits home for me right now. Yeah. What, what, um, what was your upbringing like? Were your parents around or no? Mm -hmm. Yeah. My, my parents are still married. Um, mm -hmm. I have two older sisters. And uh, when, I, when I turned right eight, eight years old, maybe, yeah. um, my dad started to travel a lot for work. So yeah. it was 
just me, my mom, and my sisters at home together. So uh, the product of that is a, a little bit of an ice guy syndrome that I had to get over. Mm-hmm. And uh, just not knowing through that rebirth that I went through, it was like knowing that I could be comfortable with that masculinity that was really just trying to like uh, exude out of me and climb out of me because mm-hmm. I was stuffing it down so much um, just through lack of education, lack of male ritual, moving on to the next level. Yeah. What is it um, like now after your rebirth? And, you know, we're all on a journey, of course. You, just because we have a rebirth doesn't mean that we're not on some kind of journey, right? Um, mm-hmm. But what, what is your definition of masculinity today? Oh, I think jujitsu teaches me so much about that, mm-hmm. of uh, what healthy and clean anger looks like and it feels like. Mm, because yeah. everything off the mat, everything off the mat is so much easier for me that I can like be more resilient against road rage, non-existent in my life because I get all of that clean anger out on the mat in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. So I think that joining a community like that has shown me what um, healthy masculinity works like on a team level, you know, like a healthy masculine will become a team player with a lot of different types of people yeah. And that's where leadership is born out of too. Yeah. And, and so when you say clean anger, uh, what's, what's the difference between clean anger and say um, dirty anger or stain? Sure. Anger? Yeah, sure. Sure. Like uh, where it comes from, is it heart centered or is it head centered? Mm. And clean anger for me is very heart centered. Um, this is what my men's group teaches me now is the difference and how to, how to be in that moment with clean yeah. anger. You know, clean anger is something that like dissipates after 90 seconds. It's very much so like, oh, my boundary is being crossed, but my assertiveness is going to come from my heart instead of my head, which is all ego driven. Yeah. So also less residue with clean anger, right? Um, I love, I haven't haven't heard anger in in that kind of way before. That's really interesting. It reminds me of like, you know, eating clean where you're not uh, eating fast food and processed food, but you're eating, you know, vegetables and organic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and to apply anger in, in those terms is really interesting. Um, but that's really helpful. Yeah, I think um, <laughs> dirty anger is uh, ego driven. Um, it's anger that is, uh, you know, like puffy chest trying to prove something. Um, um, toxic masculinity, all of that, right? So mm-hmm. this idea, because I think anger is normal, right? I mean, going back to like the angry therapist, um, the whole reason why uh, I realized I called myself that, I called myself that was because it was just humanizing the therapist, right? That anger, uh, that it's okay to be angry, you know? Um, and in this case, as long as it's clean. Yeah, totally agree with that. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up because uh, we're both, uh, into fitness, you know, I'm, I've been a strength coach for nine years mm. and the way that our body feels when we're feeding it that clean nutrition is just a complete opposite of mm. like, if we are doing the fast food and that's anger, you know, the difference of like, right. um, fueling ourselves with that clean energy and it doesn't have that residue like you were talking about. Yeah. It's just like, it's fuel for performance. How would you apply, um, cause I love this, like this idea of intentionally living emotionally clean, um, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to, um, all the yucky and, and that stuff that we feel, including anger, um, how do we make it clean? Is it, is it, is it just uh, pull is pulling from our hearts or intent? What do you think? I think that, um, that's a hell of a question, John. Um, interesting concept, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Um, well, first of all, we have to face that feeling, you know, when it comes up, uh, we have to ask ourselves, where is this originating from? Is it originating from a place where I'm going to get defensive Mm. or is it originating from a place where I can get curious? And I think that curious moment is, is how we stay, um, in that zone, in that clean arena is like, okay, well, I'm starting to feel defensive. Mm-hmm. I'm going to approach this in a da- in a different way than I never have before in my life mm. and start to ask curious questions about like, okay, can I ask you a clarifying question about what you just said to me because I'm feeling defensive? Right. You know, defense uh, instantly closes your growth door. So when you're defending, there's no room to be self-aware, uh, to be curious, to learn about yourself. Um, but when you pull from curiosity, it instantly 
um, allows you to look inward without judgment. And I think that's what's really powerful. Um, so yeah, you're right. Step number one is actually to get curious and to be aware that this feeling is even happening. And a lot of men, um, I think uh, they don't even get there because they just push that shit down, you know? And then it, and then it turns up being uh, dirty anger, <laughs> toxic mm -hmm. anger. Yeah, definitely. Not productive at all no. um, in, in communicating with our partnership or communicating at work or with our kids. Um, I, I naturally turn to anger uh, for most of my life. It was just like that, that first emotion that popped yeah. up. Yeah. And I'm still okay with feeling anger. It's just a little bit different for me now. Um, more focused through my purpose and more focused on growth as opposed to sh shutting down and being right. I think right. Brene Brown said it last week on her podcast. She said, we're here to get it right, not to be right. Mm. And, that, and that for me is where I try to come from. Um, yeah. And I think um, the, uh, the difference between clean anger and, and dirty anger is um, clean anger forms a response and uh, the, the, the toxic anger, the dirty anger uh, forms a reaction. And I know one of the biggest things for me um, that allowed me to, you know, go through my rebirth and kind of cross that great divide going from boy to man is um, the ability to respond instead of react. So most of my life, I was a walking reaction. Uh, and that reaction was fueled by anger, of course. Uh, and I was just reactive to everything, man, just defensive, reactive, um, taking hostages in my relationships, all of that. And so um, getting to a place where you could actually breathe and, um, like you said, get curious um, and then form a response, knowing how your um, behavior, words, energy is going to affect someone else. There's a responsibility there. There's a maturity there. And I think that's um, one of the biggest things that uh, make, make us adults, you know? Yeah, one, one of these days I'll grow up for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm glad that we're talking about anger because your first book was called I Used to Be a Miserable, Miserable Fuck. Yeah, uh, no, that's my second book, but it's the it's my first like like kind of um, book that's that went wide. That was um, by a uh, a big publisher. Um, yes, I used to be a miserable fuck. Uh, I, I had a lot of hesitant with uh, rea reactions. Speaking of reactions, uh, to the title, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I didn't want it to call. I didn't want to call it that, and um, I sat with it for a while, and I asked myself, you know, why. Um, and on the surface, it was because I didn't want to jump on the, the fuck train. There's a lot of self-help books with the word fuck in it. And I just, I, I just thought, I don't want it to be like kind of a fad. Um, and then I realized that it wasn't that. The truth was I didn't want to admit that, you know, I was, I was miserable. That, that uh, being a therapist, being someone who is uh, trying to help other people, admitting that he also was in a dark place uh, was embarrassing to me. And so when I realized that that's where it was coming from, and of course, then that, that had to be the title, you know, because it was truth and me leaning into that resistance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every coach needs a coach. Everybody needs outside eyes on their life. Um, I know that I've sought out counseling for shoot 20 months straight and it was the best choice I ever made. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a documents my journey and it's like uh, 66 tips. Um, you know, it, it's, it's written for men, but uh, a lot of women are buying it as well. So it's a, it's just a book on um, how to not, how to not be miserable anymore. <laughs> uh, for me, for me, in my experience, I think kind of like returning or rejoining, um, re reunited with my purpose is what gave my life so much more joy. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Um, a lot of people, especially today, you know, are kind of trying to find um, their purpose, sense of meaning. How did it happen for you? Mm -hmm. I guess we can go back to like 2008 when I was a restaurant manager mm -hmm. and the industry bottomed out. There were no management jobs left whatsoever in that recession mm -hmm. that we experienced. And I was just serving and bartending uh, at a restaurant. And I said, well, if this is all that life is going to be, I'm going to go back to school because I, I didn't finish my degree when my daughter was born. Yeah. Um, so I went back to school for exercise science and uh, interned at the University of Denver. And then when I graduated, it took me about nine months to find that purpose, um, mm -hmm. which ended up being uh, to share the benefits of fitness and, uh, fitness and nutrition for mental health. That's my purpose. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, like like the overlap between um, fitness, nutrition, and mental health, huh? Wellness. Oh, yeah, 
yep, that's exactly exactly what my purpose is. And for the first six years of my career, it was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And then I went through a couple of breakups that I was talking about earlier. And I hit that rock bottom and mm -hmm. I started my, on my rebirth. And yeah, it's so how long has that been since then, since your rock bottom? Uh, December of 2017, I think is like the most okay. accurate time um, coming up on three years total now. Years. Yeah. And how's it been for you? I mean, three years, I guess, you know, one can argue that that's a long time, but it's really not. I remember even five years after my divorce, I was still, you know, just being very sufferable. I mean, just, I was still going through it, you know, all, all mm -hmm. the deals and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Three years of this journey, um, I guess 14 to 15 years since my divorce, mm -hmm. but from my divorce, it took me 12 or 13 years, maybe even 14 to even be ready to allow that, the abundance of love to come back into my life. Oh, I'm glad you said that. And also I'm glad you said that as a man, because uh, I think stereotypically a lot of men, um, you know, after an expired relationship, after a divorce, um, they just, they just go like, they go crazy. They're out, you know, um, um, getting into other relationships, sleeping with people and all that. And, and, and I'm not judging that, but uh, um, here's an example of, you know, 10, 14 years just to even um, open up and, and, and really share your heart again. And I think that's normal. And a lot of people try to push it where it's like, yeah, it's been three months, you know, like <laughs> onto the next. And um, sometimes mm -hmm. you need that kind of time. Absolutely. You need time to kind of process why that one came to an end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was seeing somebody in the fall and um, liked her a lot. And we had a lot of connection and, um, after that relationship ended, I really started to take a hard look at, um, why that was the case. Okay. Um, somebody that you intellectually pair with mentally pair with maybe not so emotionally because she was only about eight or nine months out of her own divorce, mm -hmm. which I was aware of and like, okay, let's take this slow then. No, no problem whatsoever. Well, this is actually a good, good thing to talk about since I've got you on, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this and because of your relationship with your dad, um, it kind of, kind of spurred this question about codependency and the original research was done because of, um, alcoholism and codependency. Mm, sure. But yeah. where, where has the research gone since then to dive deeper into more common reasons why codependency occurs? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know that uh, definitely there's this um, dy a dynamic, this relationship dynamic with addicts and, and codependents. And then partly it's because um, addicts uh, don't have tools or using, they need to depend on someone. And then the codependent feels good um, helping, uh, not only helping, you know, someone else, but like almost, um, almost saving them in a way. Right. And so mm -hmm. it's like really sticky glue that's produced by, by an addict and a codependent. Um, that's why there's uh, the, um, a, a, a and also Al Anon, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, but I don't know today uh, if you if you took it out of there, I don't I don't know. But but I know that uh, codependency um, is just become uh, mainstream, you know, and I think mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Right. I don't think it's bad. I think uh, um, people are now uh, asking themselves. Uh, Am I being healthy with my love? Am I losing myself? You know, um, am I finding my own sense of worth and well-being that's not tied to, a, a, you know, something else like, like a relationship? Doesn't matter what that relationship mm -hmm. is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, losing yourself is like the key component there. Uh, that's that's becoming a part of that definition of codependency, um, that umbrella, all-encompassing kind of terminology, and. I don't believe that either one of us are alcoholics in that short-term relationship last fall, but there was still some enabling and some codependency that was occurring there. And I'm like, I, I think I need to be single on purpose for a while to understand why that occurred. Why did I abandon um, my values and my needs? And, and why did I choose to um, lose myself there? Yeah. And I don't even know if it's a choice. I think it happens over time. You know, I think a lot of times you're not even aware of it when you're in a say three-year relationship um it's like a slow leak until you wake up and you realize that you've lost yourself i don't think anyone goes into something knowing that that's going to happen or even you know being aware of it and a lot of times when we are aware of it it's almost like it's almost too late you know it's almost like we swam so far um we don't 
not only did we lose ourselves, we don't really know, we don't have a sense of self. We don't know who we are, what we want. We'd like, you know, have to start, have to start, start over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that common language is coming up in your, in your singles on purpose group as well. Mm. And I wanted to catch your philosophy on that group, but also it's your next book too. Yeah. So where did single on purpose come from? Um, it came from me um, coaching uh, in the last seven, eight years, um, thousands of people, uh, mostly women who have uh, lost themselves, right? And also um, who think they're worth less or that they're defective because they haven't found their one. And I think it's a combination of um, swipe culture, uh, you know, how toxic that is, uh, this, I, this, I, I just feel like we've all kind of be, become baseball cards and um, that plus society's pressured uh, definition of happy, which usually equals a partner. And so um, I know for me, after my divorce, I was single for uh, like five years, but I, I also was single on, on purpose. Um, and so I, I just thought that's, what we need is we, we need to empower um, being self-partnered. We need, we need to kind of shed the idea that you have to be someone, be with someone to be happy, you know? So that's, that's kind of where that came from. And then it, you know, eventually turned into a book and that should be on January. Nice. Congratulations again. Can't wait to, can't wait to read that one. And in the, in the last three years that we've been talking about, I have dated in that time. Mm -hmm. What I, what I've chosen not to do is like, rush into that commitment level right. of like we're exclusive we're boyfriend girlfriend because that's what society tells me that needs to happen well yeah i was always i was always just a little bit more hesitant because i'm like you know what i don't want this little relationship trauma to keep occurring in my life sure so yeah. so i'm going to be more intentional about getting to know somebody before i say those words of like hey you know mm -hmm. what i think that this is a good time to sit down and talk about a relationship agreement. I know that you're familiar with that. Yeah. It's probably the first place I heard of a relationship agreement is on your podcast. It doesn't sound um, sexy. I don't know if I would advertise it that way, but yes, right. I mean, at the end of the day, it is, it is agreement. Yeah. 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 Clear expectations about how we're going to right. be responsible to each other as opposed to responsible for each other. Yeah. I, I love that to each other instead of for. Uh, because when you say two, it means that you're sharing. It means that you're your own person. When you say four, there's a, uh, a compromise of self involved, right? Um, and, and by the way, you, when I say single on purpose, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't date. Um, it just means, you know, it's not an anti-relationship um, flag that I'm waving. It's a pro relationship with self. So yeah, date and, 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 and get to know people and, and all of that. Um, but just don't lose yourself in the process, right? Find yourself first. That's like the whole point. Or yeah, during, totally. find yourself during. Yeah. 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 I'm so glad that we are talking about this now because I'm, I'm like researching for a blog topic right now. And it comes from a, a quote that says we are born in wounded in and healed in relationships. Mm. And I was going to ask your opinion on the healed portion of that because yeah. You know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a lot of common threads in single on purpose that people are wounded in relationship. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, it's not an anti-relationship philosophy. It's a pro relationship with self. Right. And we can only do so much work building a, a relationship with ourselves before we have to get into a relationship to complete that healing process. Yeah. Do you agree? I, agree. I think we do. We need that runway, right? Um, runway. Good. Yeah, I think that um, healing does happen in relationships. I think um, uh, either uh, we, we could talk about your relationship with self, and obviously that's kind of where it begins, but also if you're in a healthy relationship with someone else, that can be healing, right? Because um, you're experiencing a new type of love. Uh, and, and, and also when you're in something healthy, for a lot of people, if you weren't in something health, healthy, there's going to be a lot of resistance. There's going to be, it's going to feel weird. It's going to feel maybe boring. It's going to feel strange. And when people feel that way, they usually bounce. Um, and then they just jump into the same old patterns. But if you could kind of swim past that and you process through it, um, you I'll can pass get to, the breakers. Yeah. Pass the breakers, I say a lot. Yeah. yeah. And then you can yeah. get to like um, new definitions of love. You know, I think uh, that's where the growth is. Uh, that's where like the, uh, the higher notes of love exist, I think. You know, and so, yeah, I, I definitely think you could heal. Um, 
if you are in a healthy relationship, like the relationship itself can start to be um, a, a healing vehicle, I guess, for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's constantly pushing yourself to that next level of intimacy or the next level of closeness mm -hmm. that will feel uncomfortable for a little while, especially if we're talking about attachment styles, yeah. and especially if we're talking about yeah. um, adult wounds in relationships. So yeah, to your point, like a healthy relationship might feel boring mm -hmm. to an anxiously attached person. Yeah. And I think also um, the more uh, unhealthy your previous relationships were, the more chaotic and, um, um, and dysfunctional, you know, the, your upbringing, all of that, all your experiences, life experiences were before, um, the more when you find healthy is going to like, you're not going to be used to it. You're not going to be into it. It may feel um, boring, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And unfamiliar. Unfamiliar. Exactly. Weird. All of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so when, yeah. As when, if there's when, like no spark. <laughs> yeah. I get a lot of that from clients and um, I always ask, you know, is there really no spark or is this actually healthy for the first time? And that's what you're feeling, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And thanks again for coming on John and having a conversation. I know your time's valuable. So mm -hmm. before I let you go, you talked about people or baseball cards in the swipe culture. Yeah. And is, is that why you created the twirl app? Yeah. And that's new and we're still working on it. Um, it's a, it's a startup. Um, yeah, we, we, we thought, uh, instead of swiping, having something where, uh, you get to, you actually show yourself, you know, so it's a, it's a video app right now. Um, and there's a, a grow section. So basically, the idea is it's not just about finding someone else, but it's about um, learning and growing about yourself as you're doing it. So even if you do find someone else, you're still on the app uh, and together um, learning about uh, tools and having conversations about uh, self-betterment, all of that. So it's like a dating app mean, meets a self-betterment platform. Yeah, definitely. I enjoyed try to, trying it out last week. Yeah. I recorded a video and, and, and shot it out to the universe just to see yeah. what happens. <laughs> not public yet so there's only like uh you know we, we and i invited you in so there's only a few people um and i appreciate your participation so it's going to go through you know iterations and i and all mm -hmm. of that like everything else does but um it's on it's in the app store and i'm excited about um putting it out into the world see and and, and make doing, doing my best to make a dent in swipe culture right uh congrats that's awesome um if somebody wants to get a hold of you because your message resonates with them today where's the best place to do that um, I think just at the angry therapist, Instagram, um, like you, I think that's where I kind of, um, do the most posting. Um, and of course the angry therapist.com. Mm -hmm. And along with the angry therapist.com, you have the TAT lab and that's yeah. kind of what inspired my question for you about codependency earlier. So tell me a little bit about the, the lab. Yeah, sure. Uh, so that just kind of came out of COVID, you know, um, we are all doing this now, right, for connection. Zoom has just become the common language. And I thought, uh, you know, I've always wanted to create kind of a virtual wellness space. And, and like, like, like fitness, like class pass, you could just uh, drop into various classes. Um, and so I just put a team together and uh, we're doing live wellness groups on various topics like codependency is one of our most popular, um, you know, everything from that to book clubs and stuff like that. So it's been really fun and everything's live. It's not like a recorded thing. That's awesome, John. And before I let you go, if there's one thing that we briefly touched on, didn't get to that you want to leave us with, what would that be? Um, I, I, I'm always doing um, videos and stuff like that, but you know, I think if I, uh, uh, so I don't want to leave with any kind of like lecture or, or whatever to do, do that. Um, but I would like to leave with applauding you as a uh, you know, 40 year old man and knowing more about your story now with an 18 year old daughter, um, having those conversations with her to create that kind of safe space, um, going through your rebirth, jujitsu, all of that stuff. I think you're kind of you know, the, the model of, um, of, of the new man and just even having, um, being self-reflective in your lifestyle, I think that's important. So I just wanna applaud you, we need more men like that. I appreciate that, John. I certainly don't get it perfect. Uh, the, that's not the expectation at all. Sure. Um, it's just uh, one day after the next, just yeah. be a little bit better than I used to be. Yeah. And thank God I've got jujitsu tonight and Friday night. Um, that's one of the guilty pleasures that 
I was waiting for it to reopen after COVID mm. and I was working as a strength coach in a gym and then mid March lost 90% of my income. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm so blessed to have the online training programs available that I could come home and create body weight workouts that people could do anywhere in the world sure. just on their phone. And I was for the first time in my life, given the time and no excuses whatsoever in order to start creating something that was going to drive me closer to my purpose each yeah. and every day. Yeah. So, so, so that, that means that COVID for you is, it was a catalyst for you to run closer, like towards your, your true North, huh? Yeah. I, I'm super blessed. Um, actually found some great support during this time, mm -hmm. uh, raised some capital. So now that we're marketing the programs, um, nice. it's, it is my own version of the TAT lab um, wow. for, for fitness and nutrition yeah. for people who are stuck at home. I love it, man. And then all the, the best to you. That sounds exciting. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on, John. Uh, what do you say in the next six to 12 months? We catch up uh, and see where we each other's at. Yeah, absolutely, man. We'll keep in touch. All right. Thanks a lot. Right, appreciate it. Thank you. Be well. Talk soon. Bye. Yeah, you too.